Alapa, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you're well. I hope you're enthused for today's session. We are incredibly, incredibly blessed to have a dear friend, a renowned speaker, somebody who we've had the pleasure of having her on our Zoom for some time while selling the Priceless Pearl, giving invaluable insights and introduced to me by my dear friend, Anne Cochran, who told me how amazing she was. And upon meeting her, I was even more blown away. And I'm sure you will be today. We're in for a super treat. Sheila Walcott, who became Sheila Banani, resides in California, somewhere I used to live, but I was asked to leave. Unfortunately, apparently good looking people can't stay in California. Her father, you may well know, Charles Walcott is part of Baha'i history. He was a founding member of the Universal House of Justice until his passing in 1987. And her husband, Amin Banani, also had a very illustrious father by the name of Musa Banani, who was a hand of the cause of God. Now, both Sheila and her husband, Amin Banani, were honoured with the title Knights of Baha'u'llah for opening up the region of Greece. We had the 10-year crusade in October 1952 that the beloved Guardian announced to the world, and the purpose was to open 121 new countries and territories. At the beginning of his ministry, there were 10 countries that were open, but by the end, this would turn into 121. And it needed people to arise. Who stepped up to the plate? Well, of course, dear Sheila and her husband, Amin. They went to open Greece with their daughter, Catherine. They took up this challenge and stayed for about five years, from what I understand, before a residence permit not being extended meant that they had to leave. So dear Sheila has very graciously accepted to tell us a little bit about her pilgrimage, where she got to meet the beloved guardian. And we're super excited. There's a whole bunch I could say about dear Sheila. She radiates, and you will see this, the gleaming that comes out of her face has me very excited anyway. Without embarrassing dear Sheila anymore, I will now pass it on to Sheila to share some of the history that she brings with her. Thank you very much. Dear Sheila, Alapa, and welcome. <laughs> Your introduction was <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> Uh, it, it was like a speedy trip through my life. <laughs> uh, I have the honor, really, to uh, be speaking this morning. Uh, my previous exposure to many of you was when uh, Dave had the course on Ruhi Khanum's book, Priceless Pearl. And uh, I was uh, with you during that time. So some of you know me a little bit, but for those who don't, what I'm going to try to do this morning here in Southern California, <laughs> I know it's evening in Europe, so for those of you uh, in London specifically, please forgive me if I speak about the morning time. I wanted to, during this uh, few minutes that we have together, share with you some highlights, very few highlights of course, from my notes, my pilgrim's notes, taken during the time I was on pilgrimage, to set the historical context, my husband and I, and our 10-month-old daughter, she wasn't yet walking on her own, we left United States to pioneer in Greece. And we were there for five years until we had to leave when the government no longer would extend our permits to remain and to work. When we left, of course, we had the good fortune to have a local spiritual assembly created, elected, both in 1957 and in 1958 when we had to leave. There were pioneers and native Greek believers on that local spiritual assembly. Now, the pilgrimage period that I'm going to uh, share with you was when I was 23 years old. And at that time, our baby was really quite young. And uh, my husband's mother, Sami Hebanani, agreed to come up from where she and her husband, Musa Banani, were pioneering at that time in Kampala, Uganda, in Africa. And Mama John, as we called her, helped my husband, I mean, during the time, the nine days that I was in Haifa on pilgrimage. Now in those days, this was at Resvan time, 1956. 
Western, that is English speaking pilgrims and Eastern Baha'i pilgrims. That is those who could speak Persian, Arabic, Turkish were housed separately for ease of communication, of course. And so my husband and I knew that we would need to plan a pilgrimage separately. And one of us would be able to stay in Greece with the baby while the other was on pilgrimage. So my husband went in December, 1955. His uh, memories of his pilgrimage, he has spoken about, they've been recorded. And God bless him, Earl Redman has written a book called Knights of Baha'u'llah, which came out a couple of years ago. Wonderful book. And my husband's stories are in that book as well. The period that I was on pilgrimage was 64 years ago. So you need to understand <laughs> that I'm going to recall things in uh, abbreviated form and base much of my recollection on my notes, which were never written up as a formal book, but just my, my pilgrim's notes. And they consist of, um, I don't know if you can see this, just my handwritten in green ink, because for some reason I had a fountain pen with green ink, which by the time I got to the end of my notes, I had run out of ink and I was writing in pencil. Now these are 64 years old. And uh, they are not notes taken like stenographic secretarial notes at the table when Shoghi Effendi was speaking, but they would be notes that I had written after dinner or the next day. So again, that puts them a few steps away from actual verbatim words of Shoghi Effendi. So at no time should you think that this is uh, quotations from Shoghi Effendi's uh, words themselves. And as uh, you know, all notes taken by pilgrims are not authoritative. That's fair warning. <laughs> so I will, I will try to share with you uh, just a few highlights. And I thought perhaps the best way to do that is uh, to read from some portions of my notes. And so uh, again, these are notes. This is not a book. My pilgrimage period was April 27th to May 6th, 1956. And uh, we understand, of course, for those of you who lived through that shocking period of the loss of Shoghi Effendi and the sudden passing of the guardian that uh, none of us was prepared for. I, least of all, who had been on pilgrimage just the year before Shoghi Effendi in London in 1957. The day I arrived in uh, Haifa, of course, landing at what was then called Lod Airport, taking a shirut, uh, which is a communal taxi from the airport to Haifa, to the Western Pilgrim House at number 10 Persian Street. And I arrived in the morning. Jesse Revel greeted me at the gate and ushered me into the Pilgrim House. Sylvia Ios, Leroy's wife, came out of their office to talk with me. My room faces the master's house and is the one previously occupied by Ruhia Khanum and then Millie Collins. It overlooks the gardens and the sea. Jesse took me downstairs and I fixed a little breakfast, tea and bread and butter and grapefruit. Kujita gave me a vase of roses for my room. 
Then Leroy Iowa's Jesse Reville and I drove in the guardian's car to the Shrine of the Bob. Ethel Reville, Jesse's sister, let me go into the Bob's Shrine. After saying prayers there, I went into Abdul Baha's Shrine. I am the only Western pilgrim and so went all alone. Then I walked through the gardens, then across the street and up the hill to see the progress on the archives building. It has 36 columns when the building was completed had uh, in total 50 columns. And as you know, it is similar to the design of the Parthenon on the Acropolis in Athens, where I have come from as a pioneer to pilgrimage. This is again, just the first day. We went back to the pilgrim house to prepare for lunch. Ruhi Khanum joined us at uh, 1.30. She called me Sheila and hugged and kissed me in greeting. And after a little talking, we went downstairs to lunch prepared by Millie Collins. Ham and eggs. Ruhi Khanum asked Leroy Iowa, how long and how much would the cleaning of the dome of the shrine of the Bob be? And he said 400 pounds and would take 15 days. We talked of Martha Root's silver and the decorative dessert spoons sent by Larry Houts, also of the African conventions and the Banani family and my family. The Persian pilgrims are at Bathji today and they should be returning by four or five o'clock. So at five o'clock, Ethel Ravel and I went over to the guardian's house. This is the master's house, Abdu'l-Baha's house, in which Ruhi Khanum and Shoghi Effendi live. So we went to the guardian's house, to the tea room, and joined Millie Collins, Ruhi Khanum, and Mrs. Nahvi, Mrs. Sabeti Rohani and Mrs. Motahedi. They were just three Persian women pilgrims. At 6.30 in the evening, Shoghi Effendi arrived to talk to the Persian ladies. Dr. Lutfullah Hakim came into the room and talked with us. Ruhi Khanum returned a few minutes later and you know, then we said goodbye and went back over to number 10 Persian Street. Guardian's house, master's house is at number seven across the street, number seven, Persian Street. At 7 p.m., we assembled in the drawing room. This is at number 10, Persian Street, and saw the shrine of the Bob lighted. About 7.30, the maid told us to go downstairs because Shoghi Effendi and Ruhi Khanum were waiting. I went first and was greeted by Shoghi Effendi with a handshake. He asked me to sit at the end of the table with Shoghi Effendi to my right and Ruhi Khanu to his right. And, and so the cause who were serving at that time in Haifa also were present at dinner. That's Leroy Iwas and his wife, Sylvia, both Ravel sisters, Ethel and Jesse, Dr. Lodfola Hakim, Mason Remy, Millie Collins, and I. Fujita served us dinner and Shoghi Effendi served me. Now, this is another little detail. <laughs> what did we have for dinner? Uh, many people ask me, <laughs> what did you eat? <laughs> and that night we had polo with uh, an eggplant sauce and for dessert cherries and coffee. Now this is the most interesting thing from the night's dinner conversation because every night at dinner all seven nights that I was there for dinner the conversation was of course of most value because Shoghi Effendi would speak with me and speak with the various hands of the cause and you were hearing what Shoghi Effendi wanted both me as a 
pilgrim to hear, but also he was giving instructions to his members of the appointed International Baha'i Council at that time. The highlights of, of that night's conversation. Well, again, he directed some of his remarks to me. And as a pioneer in Greece, he was giving these instructions. First of all, he asked me, had I read his world order letters? And thank goodness I had. <laughs> Wouldn't you hate to be in a position to have Shoghi Fendi ask you if you had read something that he had written and you had to say no? <laughs> Fortunately, <laughs> I had read them. So on the basis of knowing that I had read them, you know, his conversation assumed that I knew certain things. Uh, but his interests, of course, were very much with the vision of the growth of the faith. Of course, he told me I should learn Greek and Persian and teach in Greek fluently. I never became fluent either in Greek or in Persian, but I stumbled a little through it. And he said, if waiting souls, this is Shoki Effendi now instructing me. If waiting souls aren't in Athens, establish an assembly elsewhere. He says, establish one by next year, meaning 1957, which we did. Establish them with confirmed active believers. He says, the Greek Orthodox Church will oppose and persecute. The faith will spread from Greece through the Balkans to the center of Russia. Russia was behind an iron curtain at this time. Greece is the beginning and most important to establish the faith there. Then he said, we, meaning I mean and I, must remain in Greece until there is a firm active assembly. Then he spoke of the African conventions and the ratio of black to white, the settlement of the islands and centers in Europe. And then he said, I must stimulate the German National Spiritual Assembly to help Greece more. They must send pioneers. Also Persia should send pioneers. And of course, a couple of years later, they did, and we very much appreciated the support and the presence of pioneers from Germany. That ended that first day. I think I will skip ahead because I wanted to cover a couple of things with you and then have time for some questions, I hope, and some answers. Um, you know, since this was the Resvon period, interesting time of being in Haifa for the 9th of Resvon and the 12th of Resvon. And uh, the 9th of Resvon fell on Sunday, April 29th. In those days, because the archives building was being constructed, all the archives were housed in the Shrine of the Bob. Well, I, I don't know if all of them were there, but the ones the, the, the ones that pilgrims particularly uh, appreciate is to see the uh, portraits of the Bob and Baha'u'llah paintings and photographs, uh, which are available to be seen at special times only. And certainly as a pilgrim, they're a highlight of the pilgrim's visit to see these. And they were housed in the, I guess you would call it the southern three rooms of the Shrine of the Bob, not in the area where the, the Bob is buried, not, of course, in the front facing north toward Akka, where Abdul Baha is currently buried before he is moved to his shrine, which is being built now. Such an exciting time. So the archives were there and the pilgrims were taken there and Dr. Hakim shared these with us and, and the uh, Persian women, I, I think, were with me at that time. 
this was, as I mentioned, the beginning of the ninth of Rizvan, the day of the ninth of Rizvan. I walked up to the monument gardens and said the prayers appropriate for this consecrated spot. Then as I walked home to number 10 Persian Street, I saw the arrival of the niece of Baha'u'llah, whose name is Shravya Hanum. Uh, she was a very elderly woman uh, living in Nazareth, and she had come for the luncheon that was to be given in the master's house by Ruhi Khanu. All the Baha'i women of the area were invited. I was invited as well, of course, to that luncheon set up in the foyer of the master's house that ninth day of Rezvan. The Following the lunch, we went up to the area of the Shrine of the Bob, where the men had assembled with Shodhi Effendi. And they went into the Shrine of the Bob at that time. The women and the men did not go into the same side. This has all changed. I know for those of you who've been on pilgrimage in more recent times, the House of Justice changed that practice so that men and women go in to either side of the shrine. But at this time, in 1956, Shoghi Effendi led the men into one side where Shoghi Effendi chanted the Tablet of Visitation in Arabic, as you know. And uh, I was able, because we were in the other side, you know, facing, facing uh, the men, but through the curtains that separate at the threshold between where the people stand, pilgrims and, or even public when they go in, and the center room where the body of the Bob and the body of Abdul Baha are buried. We don't enter that central room. And we moved to that portion of the Shrine of the Bob where Abdul Baha is buried. And again, the guardian chanted the tablet of visitation for Abdul Baha in Arabic. So I heard him twice chanting. This is a very unusual. Uh, for a Western believer uh, to hear the guardian chant. The occasion just isn't provided for Western pilgrims, but because it was a holy day, it was possible. And I, I hear that chant in my ears always. One night at dinner, the guardian was asking Mason Remy, who had trained as an architect at the Beaux-Arts in Paris, was asking him if um, he knew what the color of the roof had been when the Parthenon was built on the Acropolis in Athens. And Mason Remy had dozed off. He was sitting in his chair at the dinner table, but it was after dinner. The conversation was continuing. And when Shoghi Effendi asked Mason Remy, this question, if he knew what color the roof had been, because you know it had blown up and didn't exist for many years. Uh, so if you go there as a tourist, you don't see any roof on the Parthenon. As Shoghi Effendi was planning for the roof tiles for the Baha'i Archives building on Mount Carmel, he had an interest in knowing if Mason could provide that information to him. But Mason Remy had dozed off in his chair, sitting upright. I, I guess he was in his early 80s at that time. And he didn't respond to Shoghi Fendi's question. And I, who was sitting between them, because Shoghi Fendi was sitting to my right and Mason Remy was sitting to my left. And so they were opposite each other at the table. It was an oval dining room table. I had my eyes on Shoghi Effendi and when he asked the question and Mason didn't answer, I thought, oh my goodness, what's going to happen now? And Mason didn't answer and Shoghi Effendi repeated the question one more time, noticed of course that Mason Remy was not awake enough to have even heard his question. So Shoghi Effendi just went on to another subject and I thought, oh my goodness, 
Now, this is important only because I was then told when it was time for me to go to Bahchi, to the shrine of Baha'u'llah, which as a pilgrim, you didn't just go on your own, you waited until Shoghi Effendi said that he would send you there. It was time to go there. So Shoghi Effendi at that time asked Mason Rimi to go with me to uh, Bahaji for two days. And thank goodness, Millie Collins was also invited to come on that trip because Mason Rimi didn't feel well the first night that we stayed in Bahaji. And as a result, he went back to Haifa. And if Millie Collins hadn't been there with me, I would have been all by myself. I don't know that they would have liked that. <laughs> Maybe they would have changed the whole arrangement. Anyway, I was able to be two nights in the mansion, sleeping in the mansion and uh, visiting the area uh, as the only pilgrim at that time for that portion. And that happened to fall on the 12th day of Lisbon. So these were special treats really as a pilgrim that I was able to uh, enjoy. A visit to the Rizvon Garden, which is in that area of Akka and Abachi near, nearby. And uh, of course, all of the other important pilgrimage sites, the prison, which of course had not been renovated at that time to which I took an armload of flowers from the Rizvon garden that had been given to me to lay in the cell of Baolas in the prison and saw the place where Mirza Mehdi fell through the skylight, fell to the floor, and of course, ultimately passed away as a young man at the prison. And the house of Abud and the house of Mazar A all were visited during that period. The mystery of the choosing of the tiles of the roof on the archives building passed without an answer, but Shoghi Effendi had in mind what he wanted. And this was an interesting thing for me to witness as a pilgrim sitting at the dinner table. Remember, I said I was 23 years old not finished my education as I was ultimately able to do a few years later. I was not an architect. I was not a designer. Nevertheless, Shoghi Fendi asked my opinion. And he said that he wanted me to go up on the mountain, Mount Carmel, the next day and look at the assortment of tiles that he was considering for the rooftop tiles for the archives building. He needed to make that order. At first, you know, he didn't tell me what his preference was. Go up and select what you like the best and come back and tell me. So the next night at dinner, he asked me, had I gone up on the mountain to see the tiles, which had been laid in scaffolding uh, at an angle that would be the angle they would be if they were on, mounted on the roof so that you would see how the light would affect them, the clouds and these kinds of things. This is, this is the kind of careful thinking that Shoghi Effendi had. His aesthetic taste was exquisite. And this is the way he approached that choice. So the next night, I can't remember what I told him when he asked me. I mean, I, I said, yes, of course I had gone to see. I wasn't interested in my preferences, so I didn't write them down and I, didn't, I don't remember them. But I do remember Shoghi Effendi, who said that he liked, now he reveals his preference, he liked green. He particularly liked the way copper, when it's wet and ages, turns a greenish color. He liked that kind of green rather than blue. And he liked matte finish, not shiny tiles. Then he instructed Leroy, to order the tiles from Holland, as I understand. Green, not blue. Matte, not shiny tiles. Well, I think uh, because uh, time is passing that I should stop. 
my conversations with you and ask you if you have any questions that you wish to ask of me so that I allow enough time for that. You're under no time restraints at all. Um, just so you know, dear Sheila, we're all absolutely blown away by what you're sharing with us. So just currently as things stand, um, I see we've got one uh, one question from dear Alex to come. And if you wish to ask a question, by all means, just raise your hand on the Zoom chat. If you're not too familiar with it, you can always unmute yourself to do so. But um, uh, we'll start off with dear Alex. Alex, please. To uh, be in the magnetic presence of uh, of such an amazing light to the world, it must make a deep impact. I want you to know that uh, for me as a child growing up in a family that originally was a Christian, Protestant Christian. My father came from Episcopalian background and my mother from a Presbyterian background. These are Protestant Christian. Uh, views that they had. I was five years old when they both, my parents, became Baha'is. So I don't remember uh, anything other than the Baha'i faith in my family, but you know we are all independently able to choose what it is we wish to believe, and it isn't uh, automatic that when you grow up in a Baha'i family that you become a Baha'i. So I uh, was sort of foot dragging, as we call it, uh, when I reached the age of 15. And I remember asking my father a question, something about maybe I should read John Esselmont's Baha'u'llah and the New Era, which was treated like a Baha'i text, you know. We didn't have a whole lot of them then. And he didn't right away give me a copy. You know, in those days, parents somehow thought that it was important not to uh, be persuasive uh, and not to be expectant that their children would automatically want to become Baha'is. And they shied away and had a very infrequent occasions where anything remotely resembled, resembling a Baha'i class for children would be offered. Now, this was not true of Baha'i children raised in Iran, which of course I came to learn later. You went to Darsakh Log, you, you know, these were, this was the way Baha'i children were raised, but not in America and not in Southern California. <laughs> I can't speak for all of America. And so I sort of, had a you know teenage period that was not motivated by the Baha'i teachings until I somehow got a hold of a copy of the Dawnbreakers, Nabil's narrative. And by the time I finished reading the Dawnbreakers, I wanted to become a Bobby. That was not, however, an option. <laughs> so I said, yes, I want to be a Baha'i. I was at that point, just 17. And I'm telling you all this, Alex, because this is the way I approached what I did immediately following that. I became a Baha'i in, uh, in the Los Angeles area as my parents were both Baha'is. At that time, my father was serving as a member of the local spiritual assembly in Los Angeles. He was not at that time an elected member even of the National Spiritual Assembly of the United States. He was just a member of the local spiritual assembly. If I told you the rest of my biography, it was it's sort of unbelievable to me anyway, that things happen so fast. I met my husband for the first time. He was 23. And he was at that stage of his academic career, pursuing his graduate degrees at Stanford that he was looking for a wife, I guess. I, I mean, I was certainly just about to enter the university as a freshman at UCLA, the University of California at Los Angeles. And UCLA, which I did enter, was the beginning. And I'm not thinking of marriage or anything like that. 
So the fact that within another six months, by February 1951, after having become a Baha'i in March 1950, meeting Amin, my uh, future husband, in July of 1950, and we marrying in February 1951, and then going pioneering in summer of 1953, by that time, my father had been elected to the National Spiritual Assembly of the United States. Amin's father had been appointed a hand of the cause in Africa, where both his parents were pioneering along with his sister, Violette, and her husband, Ali Chavani. So our arrival in Greece, as I mentioned, in summer of 1953, look, look how compressed that time period is, how important our choices are at every step of our life. Every step of our life contains an opportunity to serve. And we never know, I don't think, the value of each day. And we've got another question also from uh, Mr. Ashian Rahmani. Alapa, thank you so much. It's such a beautiful uh, insight into pilgrimage at the time of Shoghi Effendi and meeting with Shoghi Effendi. Thank you so much. The turmoil that we see in the United States in the last few years and 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 those things. I wonder if there were any comments. And I've been reading a lot from Pilgrim Notes and and some of those things about the you know about the U.S. Um, and that Shoghi Effendi talked about as well. And I just wonder if in your visits and in your pilgrimage that there were any comments that he shared about America's. What did Shoghi Effendi say about conditions in America? He was very specific. In fact, that interested me that uh, although I was an American, but I was coming as a pioneer from Greece. So my interests were in his advice on teaching in the faith in Greece. And I was married to a Persian, so I was interested in his cultural issues around cross-cultural marriages, but he showed you, Fendi, spent one evening uh, extensively talking about, for example, of course, I can't put my hands on my notes right now to get to that page without pausing too much, and uh, I don't want to burden you with long waits here. But he spoke about how, uh, never mind if uh, you know, conditions in America are such that uh, they not only are confused <laughs> now, but they will increasingly be uh, uh, facing catastrophes. And then he made a comment about about New York, very negative comments about uh, that New York was Babylon. And we know what image that calls up to mind. This is my recall from my notes. It doesn't matter what the major plan of God does in terms of disrupting because it does matter in a way that this is the way God assists the forward progress if we are, as Baha'is, doing what we need to be doing in our so-called minor plan. <laughs> we executing the minor plan of God. Have a plan, pursue it with perseverance, regardless of what's happening in the world, around us. And even though the major plan of God, God's plan, works by disaster, which we see nowadays as well as in those days, <clears throat> it is ultimately helping the breakdown of an inadequate framework and structure uh, of governance, of just neighborliness, allows the Baha'is the opportunity to 
plow ahead relentlessly with our activities according to our very organized plans of teaching. And that the success really, even if we don't see it, we, we don't understand how the major plan of God, God operates in these catastrophic ways that we, keeping our heads on straight, <laughs> it's an expression, uh, are not deterred, uh, should not be deterred from what it is, the guidance that we are given as Baha'is to pursue. That's a long answer, but it captures what he said. Do we have any other questions, waiting, ladies and gentlemen? May I know the name of your father? Charles Wolcott. My mother's name was Harriet Wolcott. My father was a musician and a composer, and he uh, was the head of the music department at Walt Disney Studios um, from when they arrived in 1938, I think it was, in California. And then he went from Walt Disney Studios to Metro Goldwyn Mayer Studios. And he was the head of the music department, which was a, an administrative and a business as well as a creative position because he used to conduct the studio orchestras for some of the films. And, <clears throat> Anyway, he was, my father was elected uh, to that International Baha'i Council that was the first elected one called by the hands of the cause after the passing of Shoghi Effendi. Now the, when Shoghi Effendi died, the hands of the cause for six years were custodians of the faith. And part of what they were doing was planning for the end of the 10 year crusade, which would come in 1963. And then they would have the hold the election for the first universal house of justice for the guidance to be given to the Baha'i world from universal house of justice because the hands of the cause felt that that interregnum period of six years was all that they were responsible for in carrying out to the end of Shoghi Effendi's plan. His plans did not extend beyond the 10-year plan, the 10-year crusade, the 1963 period. So when the hands of the cause were meeting during that six-year period, one of the tasks that they took up was to, uh, of course, the appointed International Baha'i Council, appointed by Shoghi Effendi, ceased to exist. And the election was called by the hands from the existing National Spiritual Assembly members in the world, extant at that time, to elect a body of, I think there were nine individuals, of which some were women, and one of them was my father. And so at this point, 1961, my parents moved to Haifa because of the, being on, my father being on the International Baha'i Council. He had to leave Hollywood, resign his position. And he was at that time in his mid fifties, I think it was. He was born in 1906 and in 1961, yeah, 1961, he and mom moved to Haifa for him to serve on the International Teaching Council. And then my mother hardly unpacked her bags because she thought, you know, when the House of Justice is elected, then they would come back home, home meaning the States. My father was elected to the Universal House of Justice. So oh, she couldn't unpack her bags as we used to kid her. 
your dear father, Charles Walker, also um, he was involved with film scores, from what I understand, and, and contributed to Bambi. I don't remember which ones. He actually he went to work with Disney at the time that uh, Disney uh, was uh, doing Fantasia, and there is a portion in that film Fantasia of original musical score that my dad wrote for the film. Most of the music in it was Stravinsky and you know famous musicians that they were using. But there was a little bridge, a jazz music bridge of music that my dad wrote that's incorporated in there. I don't even know if he's given credit for, for that. He was working with Disney at that point. Amazing. Thank you. We have a question from the UK from Mr. Nick Wilding. Dear Sheila, thank you so much for sharing these precious yeah. memories with us. We really, really appreciate that. Um, just a simple question. I know you, you've probably been asked this question a thousand times, but just we just wanted to know what is, in a simple way, your most enduring memory of the beloved Guardian from your personal point of view? Shogi Fendi had this absolutely wonderful way that it, you would have to see it and experience it to believe it. But I'm telling you, this is my experience. Shogi Fendi would sit at the dining room table dinner table time. That was the only time the Western Pilgrim I had with Shogi Effendi, but it was like a two hour period. It was not an insignificant amount of time. And uh, he would be directing questions or making comments and also engaging in giving instructions to uh, the hands of the cause who were also seated at the table in terms of their position as helpers on Shoghi Effendi's International Baha'i Council. So he would ask, for example, Leora Iwas to go to Jerusalem to uh, talk with the governmental agencies there about things having to do with the Baha'is and again, getting materials into the uh, country of Israel for the building of, at that time, the archives building on Mount Carmel. And so it was for me like sitting at a uh, business table, but so much better. <laughs> In other words, work was being conducted um, in front of me as a pilgrim. There was nothing, uh, you know, confidential uh, that was said, but it was. I mean, you were sitting in the commander's tent, so to speak. And the commander, Shoghi Effendi, was treating you like you were one of his lieutenants. And it was terribly exciting to me. Uh, I mean, as I told you, I was, I didn't know what to expect when going on pilgrimage. I had nothing to compare it with. My parents never went on pilgrimage, never met Shoghi Effendi. They had that opportunity to ask, but they didn't. And I always ask my mother, why didn't you ask for pilgrimage? And she said, I was afraid Shoghi Effendi would ask me what had I done for the faith? And I couldn't answer that I had done anything significant. And I said, oh, mom, that isn't the only reason to go to Haifa. I don't know if I've answered it adequately for you, but it was, uh, pilgrimage is a unique thing for every pilgrim. So when you ask a question like that, you will probably get a variety of answers. It's a good question. Thank you very much. During the days of pilgrimage with beloved guardian, did you meet with him every night? Yes, uh, every seven, seven nights, because two nights I stayed in Bachi. I can tell you actually something <laughs> that made him laugh. I, I, I made him laugh apparently 
to the delight of Millie Collins, who wrote to my parents. She knew my parents and she knew me. She was so happy when I mean and I got married because she said, you know, that this is a marriage of East and West and her love of Ruhi Khanum and Shoki Effendi, viewing that as a marriage of East and West, of course, uh, she felt that our marriage was another success. So I wanted to tell you about a time that Shoghi Fendi laughed. And then if I don't forget, I'd like to read you part of Millie Collins' letter that she wrote to my parents that I didn't see for 30 years until my dad passed away. And I found it in his files when I went to Haifa to pack up my mother and bring her back to live with us in California after my dad died. In 1987. He's buried in the Baha'i Cemetery on Mount Carmel. And one night when I was in Bachi, the two nights that I spent there, one of them, the first night, Ellie Collins slept in the room that was always occupied by Shoghi Fendi when he went to Bachi. And that's the room in the mansion house at Bachi, across from the room where Baha'u'llah passed away. And all pilgrims who've gone there have gone to that room in particular, said their prayers in the room where Baha'u'llah ascended the end of May, 1892. Millie Collins and I were in Bachi and said our prayers. And then Millie retired to, we referred to it as Shoghi Fendi's room, just across the hall. And I can't remember what room I was given to sleep that first night. But I'm going to tell you about the second night. The second night in Bachi, Millie said to me that she had decided that I should sleep in Shoghi Fendi's room. And I felt very, uh, uh, you know, concerned. I said, no, no, I, Millie, I think, you know, Millie was elderly at that point, And it was not my position to disagree with her. Uh, but I, I felt that, you know, she was being kind to, to offer, but she insisted that I sleep in Shoghi Fendi's room. And so I went into Shoghi Fendi's room when it was time to sleep. But of course, I couldn't sleep. So I spent my time looking around the room. And in that room, for those of you who've been on pilgrimage, this is perhaps still the case that Shoghi Fendi had multiple editions in different languages of Esoman's book, Baha'u'llah and the New Era. This was a great pride of Shoghi Fendi's that these pioneers in different parts of the world had found ways to translate this textbook that Esomont had written into these various languages. And you remember he, Shoghi Fendi used to frequently give us a count of how many languages there were Baha'i writings translated into. So anyway, I found on the bookshelf several copies of Baha'u'llah and the New Era in Greek. So when I got back to Haifa, I did dinner. And there were seven nights that I had dinner, but they were interrupted by two nights that I was in Bachi. So that's why it's not nine nights with dinner conversation with Shoghi Effendi. So when I got back to uh, Haifa, Shoghi Effendi said, well, how did you enjoy uh, your time in Bachi? And the first thing that leapt out of my mouth, and this is a 23 year old, please forgive me, was Shoghi Fendi. You have all those copies of Baha'u'llah in the era and the new era in Greek, and we don't have any in Athens. Now, I must tell you, he burst out laughing and he directed Leroy. I was, he said, send six copies to her, but send them to Horace Holly, who was secretary of. National Spiritual Assembly in the United States. And he will then send them to Greece so that there would not be direct. 
and send one of them to uh, Turkey, have him send one of the copies of, in Greek to Turkey. You know, the traditional animosity between the Greeks and the Turks was occurring at that time as well. So I was so delighted. And I must tell you that that translation into Greek was made through the efforts of Martha Root, who had visited in Athens in 1934. And uh, uh, had, she had gotten some Athenian professor to translate, but in very formal Greek, I found out. And it was impossible for the Greeks of our day, 1956, 57, to understand most of it. It was too formal. Uh, in English, it would be like reading, I guess, <laughs> old English. You know, it was hard for them to understand. Can I also read just a paragraph from Millie Collins' letter that I discovered she had written to my parents? Because it deals with this aspect of Shoki Effendi that, uh, which thrills me and thrilled me at the time when I was grieving the passing of my father in 19, January 1987. She wrote it in her handwriting, which I'm showing you. Um, but I typed it because it's easier for me to read. And the, I left Haifa at the end of pilgrimage on May 6th. And the letter that Millie Collins wrote is dated May 7th, 1956. And it's addressed to Mr. and Mrs. Charles Walcott, Los Angeles, California. Beloved friends, Millie writes, I cannot resist telling you how much we enjoyed Sheila. I know she made our beloved guardian happy. She was so radiant, so natural, and asked constructive questions. I bless her doubly because I know she drank in everything he said to her, and she will tell you how adorably he reiterated, patience, you must have patience. Edna Johnson preceded her, and I was sent to Bachi with her. First time I was allowed to go over to spend the night as it has been cold. And when I found I was to stay two nights with Sheila in Bachi, if I felt all right, I was thrilled. And really it did me good to see a young Baha'i so alive was stimulating to say the least. Well, I'm sure she will write you fully this is just my line to tell you what a fine, lovely daughter you have, or really to add my sentiments to yours. This is very special. I don't know why my father never shared it with me, but I'm so grateful I found that letter. I'm wondering what's your thought and idea about this era in America, the prejudice and everything which there is now about the black people and the, all these things. Yes, uh, thank you for asking this question because I am very involved uh, in this issue. I have to tell you that as a teenager, what attracted me most to the Baha'i faith were its social teachings on race, race prejudice, which I was fully aware of as a teenager in America. And this would have been in 1950, obvious to anyone with their eyes open that this instruction of Abdul Baha and followed by Shoghi Effendi in Advent of Divine Justice in particular, this was a disease that had infected and resided latently and would openly develop explosively in America till such time as it was eradicated. And it did not seem there was any way 
to eradicate it, except by understanding the basic Baha'i principle of the oneness of humanity. This really was what led me to become a Baha'i because I felt this was such an important issue in America back in 1950. And now we are 70 years later, almost 71 years later, the issue is refreshingly brought up again because it has not been resolved, but the attention to it is has increased. We Baha'is must turn our efforts realistically focused on healing this terrible disease. There isn't a vaccine for it. It's a daily struggle to understand. I can't stress this enough. Beautifully said, dear Sheila. Thank you so much. Thank you very much indeed. Yes. Thank you. Sheila, I have a question of my own, if I can, and it's maybe too difficult to really formulate an answer to this. But you mentioned that you were, because of a holy day, you got to witness the beloved guardian chanting in Arabic. And from what I understand, and maybe someone could correct me if I'm wrong, the Guardian had a slight Esfahani accent, I hear. Um, this, this is what I understand. But are you able to, to try and bring that to life for us? And it's probably, it's an impossible, uh, impossible task, I'm, I'm sure. But there are many of us who, the majority of us, haven't had that bounty. Well, I, I can tell you that I personally would not be able to understand the the differences that would make it an Esfahani dialect. Uh, but my husband swears that his exposure to the chanting of Shoghi Fendi confirmed in his mind, and he's the, he's the linguistic expert in our family, not I. So Anin says that Shoghi Fendi definitely did have an Esfahani uh, accent uh when he would speak persian and uh whether or not he had that in chanting in arabic i i can't say i don't remember if he said that and the chances are he may not have heard him heard shogi Effendi chanting in arabic that i mean because not with every pilgrim did shogi Effendi lead them into the shrines and chant. So I, I can't say, I don't know. But I do know that I mean said in when in his speaking voice. Yes, he did have an Esfahani. And then he would give one or two examples. But then I, I can't do that because my Persian isn't good enough. But okay. set, setting the scene, here you are, you're 23, I believe. Um, so this was some 20 years ago, I'm guessing, that you were going, <laughs> you were going to be going on pilgrimage. Four years ago. <laughs> you were going on pilgrimage. I mean, what was, as you arrived there, what, were there any expectations? What was going through? You're, you're meeting the sign of God on earth for the very first time. I mean, are you able to try and take us into that, that time frame as in, you know, what transpired and... and, and you well, know, uh, part of it, I think, Part of my reaction was as a, uh, a Baha'i who didn't have knowledge of other people's pilgrims, pilgrimages, except what I would have heard secondhand or, you know, and it was not, remember, uh, Palestine uh, and State of Israel were uh, in a mission of uh, unrest, let's say, <laughs> all during the 40s, during the war, the Second World War, and following the Second World War until the declaration of the State of Israel in 1948, pilgrimages were uh, postponed or, or, you know, rescheduled or canceled. Uh, and really, I mean, father, Musa Banani, and Sami Hibanani made 
amongst the first pilgrimages back in when they went in 1951. Uh, the Guardian had just opened, reopened for pilgrimage uh, maybe the year before, I'm not sure, after the state of Israel was declared and things were quieting down a little bit in terms of the uh, uh, chaos and uh, difficulty of traveling and uh, in that area. Um, I think uh, my uh, expectation was not, could not realistically be based on Amin's experience, even though he had just gone in December and I was going now in April. It was just a few months later in that April, 1956. But Amin's experience was as an Eastern pilgrim, which was not going to be my experience at all. Even though we visited the same shrines and we visited the same uh, areas in Haifa, Achi, and Akka, at Masra'e, it was, it, it was different. Thank you, dear Sheila. We've kept you way too long and I'm, I'm fully aware of this. I loved every minute of it. <laughs> really words that will ruminate in our minds and hopefully we will do exactly that. It is a privilege, a priceless privilege that each one of us have and you've inspired us and hopefully we can all inspire each other to carry this on and to be connected in history through yourself, learning more about the Guardian and the experiences. This is something that the idea is that we take on in our lives and, and the story continues out, it sends out these ripples. So certainly on behalf of everyone, we are beyond thankful that you've been kind enough to share with us. Dear Sheila, any last things to say to people younger? Any advice you'd give us? A final last word be given to yourself. Uh, one word to the youth. Um, I was once a youth. <laughs> and uh, let me tell you that the youth have the energy, the vigor, the adventurousness, the sense of invincibility, which is, of course, a little misplaced, but never mind, it probably goes with the other qualities. Uh, these virtues stand you in good stead to do audacious things in your youth. Don't wait until you're too old and think that you can't do these things. When you're young, you don't know you can't do them, so you do them. I hope that that is an encouragement. <laughs>